So we're talking about where did my children learn that? And he asked me to speak to you today about the occult and yoga. And so I added to it syncretism in your kids. And I've got to tell you, it's uh, not particularly a fun topic. The subject of the occult and deception in the church is generally guaranteed to make you about as popular as an aardvark at an ant convention. You know, Christians feel, I don't need to know about that. I don't need to be looking into what that's about. It doesn't affect me. After all, in Christ, I'm a new creature. All the old bad things have fallen away. I don't need to think about that or talk about that, much less learn about that anymore. But I will tell you, to ignore the subject of prophecy and spiritual deception and the occult is to turn your back on a significant portion of the Bible, including the warnings, and there are many of them, Old and New Testament, but these warnings from Jesus Christ himself on the subject. Matthew 24, we all know that passage. Lord, what are the signs of the end of the age and your coming? And Jesus gives many signs, doesn't he? Wars, rumors of wars, plagues, famines, earthquakes, things that we have always seen, but that he said at the end of the age would be increasing in intensity and in number globally, worldwide. But there's one test that most people in the church, including tragically most pastors, seem to miss altogether. Verse 4 in Matthew 24, Jesus starts out, Lord, what are the signs of the end of the age and your coming? He starts out by saying to them, see to it, no one mislead you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, and will mislead many. Whoa, what's that about? Right out of the shoot, Jesus is talking about heads up, first key sign of the coming will be, and of the end of the age, will be spiritual deception on a massive scale, false Christ. And then he says something interesting in verse 11. He says, and he talks about many will uh, fall away, will betray one another, will hate one another. Many false prophets, he says in verse 11, will arise and will mislead many. So he's given us false Christs in verse 4. Now he's warning us about false prophets in verse 11. And then in case you didn't get it the first couple of three times the Lord mentions it, pay attention. If Jesus tells you once, sit up and take notice. If he tells you twice, you know he really means it. But in the same passage and in that context, he says again in verse 23, then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe him. For false Christs and false prophets will arise. And now listen to this, pay attention, and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead were it possible, even the elect. And clearly it is possible. How do you know, Johanna? Well, A, because the Lord told me, and B, because all through Scripture, Old and New Testament, you see verse after verse after verse. Once you start looking for it, you get tired of seeing it. Be on the alert. Do not be deceived. Test the spirits. Why? Because many false teachers and prophets have gone out into the world. And what he's talking about here are people who are coming with genuine spiritual power, so impressive and done clearly in the name of a Christ, that you're bound to think, surely this must be true revival. Truly, this must be the sign that the Lord is present here. And we assume in the church that if the phenomena is real, it has to be from God. If it gives me the warm fuzzies, it has to be from the Spirit of the Lord. Nothing could be further from the truth. What he's telling us about, the key sign of the end of the age, are Christian occultists. False Christs, false prophets who come in the name of the Lord. How do you know that? Matthew chapter 7, the Lord tells me, where he gives us that little overview, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, beginning in verse 15, but inwardly, spiritually, by what they're teaching you, they're ravenous wolves. You'll know them by their fruits. And tragically, you've got a lot of people out there who think, oh, I'm feeling so much better. I'm showing good fruit now, love, joy, peace, patience. Let me tell you, as an ex-Christian occultist myself, there is a counterfeit Jesus, there's a counterfeit Holy Spirit, there's a counterfeit gospel, there's also counterfeit fruit. I was never so holy and righteous and committed and full of peace as I was when I was involved 
in the deepest part of the occult era of my life, working with the medium and civil mind control and yoga and all the rest of that. But after this little lesson in spiritual agriculture, good trees don't produce good fruit, bad fruit doesn't come from good trees, etc. He says then the rest of the story that so many people in the church never pay attention to. He says in verse 21 of Matthew chapter 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. What, 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 what do you mean does the will? Are you telling me that Jesus is preaching a gospel of works? No. Compare scripture with scripture. What is the will of the Father? This is the will of the Father that you believe in him whom he has sent. John chapter 6, 28 and 29 and other passages. No, what is the will of the Father in the context here? Listen to what he's saying. Many will say to me on that day, verse 22, but Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name do what? Perform many miracles. They're not going to be standing before the white, great white throne judgment of the living God at before which only unbelievers appear at the end of the millennium and say, but Lord, we were like Popoff. We had little microphones in our ear and people were giving us information, but golly, look how many people came and, and to the front and said, gee, I love Jesus. These people are showing up saying, hey, wait a minute, Lord, Lord, what are we doing here? We have relationship with you in your name. And Jesus said, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you, why? Because they had fallen for the, for the demonic age old trap of believing that genuine phenomena necessarily comes from God. They'd never read Deuteronomy 13 verse one, when a prophet or if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and it comes true, genuine phenomena. Concerning what he says to you, let us follow after other gods. You shall not listen to that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. Oh, but we aren't following after other gods. We're following Jesus. Hunky Dory, my first mentor, Walter Barton, used to say, which one? The Jesus of Madonna that the kids like to listen to? I saw a little poster that said, uh, Madonna embraces Jesus. And I thought, oh, praise God, she's come to Jesus. She's going to start wearing clothes now. But then you read the rest of the story and you find out on the second page that Jesus, Jesus, was the name of her new 15 year old, younger than she was, practically 15 years old lover. And she, when Madonna embraced Jesus, it wasn't the one you and I might be thinking of initially. And I will declare to them, I never knew you, depart from me, you who work lawlessness. We are being groomed, the world is being groomed for the establishment of a one world government, a one world religion, a one world religion that is bound together by a mystical experience and altered states of consciousness that confirm that we are all a part of God. That religion is going to be led by one whom scripture identifies in several places as the Antichrist. In 2 Thessalonians 2, listen to what it says here. He starts in verse three. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. People, we are up to our collective eyelashes in apostasy in the church. It's going to get worse. As we approach the final end of the end times, you're going to be seeing an increase in false teachings, false Christ, false prophets. But that apostasy has already begun. The son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. You're going to have one who's going to be coming and sitting in the temple of God and standing up and saying, oh, yes, I am God. And all the rest of us sitting here will have assumed that, well, gee, he has to be God because look, what is it that scripture talks about in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 9? Who is this Antichrist? That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders. He's not talking false as the Germain, the pull the rabbit out of the hat. He's talking about genuine power produced by another Jesus, a counterfeit spirit, a counterfeit gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. No, 11, verse 3, 4, and 5, sorry. 
And in that place, he's warning us, for this reason, you're going to be seeing that this Antichrist is coming with all power, signs, and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish. Why? Because they did not have a love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false in order that they may all be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. That is a frightening thing, people, because this Antichrist is going to come and say, I am God, and most of us, 15, 20, 30 years ago, if you stood up and said, I am God, they immediately would have grabbed the, the, the straight jacket and put you in a rubber room next to the guy who thinks he's a poached egg, right? I am God, yeah, right, utterly delusional. Where's Cleopatra? They'll make a nice team. Today, now, you've got people in the church saying, I am God. Kenneth Copeland, there's a whole slew of them. We don't have time to get into them, but gosh, that's a study in and of itself. And here this man, this Antichrist, sits in the seat when the temple is rebuilt on the Mount, Temple Mount, and he says, I am God, and the rest of us are going to say, yeah, it's just he's godier than the rest of us. It's not going to take us off guard. We too are working all these mystical powers. The religion of the mystical experience and the altered states of consciousness that confirm that we too are all a part of God. Jesuit mystic Carl Rayner said, the Christian of the future will be a mystic, someone who has experienced something or he will be nothing. This one world ruler, the Antichrist, will have genuine satanic power and will deceive even the elect for a time. He is not coming in a vacuum. He will claim to be God, and he will have the demonic occult power to prove it. All right, occult. What am I talking about when I say the word occult? Let me give you a little definition here. It comes from the Latin occultus, to conceal the secret, hidden, dark, mysterious, transcendental, supernatural, beyond the boundary of ordinary or natural knowledge, that which is communicated only to the initiated, that's pre-internet, I presume, that this way. Now you can go on the internet and get all of the mystical things that were only communicated to the initiate. It's all over the internet now, tragically. Those phenomena that are beyond the five senses, the supernatural phenomena started, started, studied by parapsychology. It involves contact knowingly or unknowingly with supernatural agencies or powers. It's also defined as the mystical art of conforming reality to will. It is the techniques, the ability, supposed, and there is genuine power behind it, to so picture what you want in your mind that you force reality to conform to your will by mastering techniques of altered states of consciousness. It was known back in the old hippie days as the New Age. Now it's known better as the New Spirituality, the New Gospel, the New World View. The New Age is basically Eastern Hinduism, Eastern mystic philosophy, the age of Aquarius that we're all seeking to, you remember here, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius, well, it's upon us. Occultism, another term for New Ageism, is defined as the science of mystical evolution. It is the employment of the hidden, in other words, occult, mystical faculties of man, to discern the hidden reality of nature, to see God as all in all. Ray Jungen quoted that in A Time of Departing. By the way, if you haven't read his brilliant book, that will give you an awesome foundation for a lot of what's happening in the church to harness this mystical power. In other words, to put it in simple terms, the occult is simply man's attempt to become God, and it's really not very complicated. Okay, if you didn't understand all that definition I read you, welcome to the club. I don't get half of it myself. Most people who blather about it extensively don't get it. What are you talking about, though? It's as simple as Genesis chapter 3. The Word of God wasn't going to leave us pondering and scratching our heads saying, huh, huh, what is this? What are we talking about? Look, in Genesis chapter 3, you remember the passage. Beginning in verse 1, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field the Lord God made, and he said to the woman, point number one in the occult, Indeed, has God said, the first thing you will see 
in the, in the, the realm of occultism, the new age, mysticism, whatever you choose to call it, is a questioning of the word of God. Oh, it's all been so rewritten, the word of God, you know, who, indeed, did God really say, in fact, is God really who he claims to be? Maybe he's a she, maybe he's an it. Maybe he's the force of Star Wars. That's what George Lucas wanted countless millions of kids to believe. He wrote that with a deliberate religious agenda in mind. Indeed, as God said, calling into disrepute and question the validity and the inerrancy of this book from Genesis to the end of the uh, book of Revelation. Now listen to what he says. He totally contradicts God. First, uh, he's asked the woman a question and. Uh, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said, well, we can have everything we want. But from the tree in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it or touch it. Adam's editorial comment, I suspect, or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, now he's moved from questioning to blatant contradicting the word of God. Point number two, you surely will not die. There is no judgment. There is no narrow-minded, Bible-thumping, fundamentalist, bigoted, evangelical God who actually is going to send someone or allow anyone to go to a place of eternal separation from him, a place called hell, a place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place of fire and torment and brimstone. Surely, there is no judgment. There is no separation. There is no hell. You surely will not die. When God has said, dying, you will surely die in the day that you disobey me. Here, Satan is contradicting him. There is no judgment. No, no, what you do is like Jonathan Livingston Siegel, go on into cosmic cyclic reincarnation. You know the whole recycling program? This is recycling on a cosmic level. You just get to go to Tirnanog or Summerland or, or Purgatory or someplace out there where you get to be reborn into something nicer than what you wound up with this time because boy, God wasn't paying attention when he made you. Ha, not the case. You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened. And here it is, point number three, you will be as God. You will have the power, the, the abilities, all of the, the attributes of the creator God. You will be as God. And here comes the final kicker, knowing good and evil. You will have power and you will have knowledge. And there, right there, is in simple terms, is the whole mystery of the new age, of the occultism, of the mystical practices. You will be as God, you will have knowledge and power. There are, hell, love wins, Rob Bell tells us. There is no hell. Brian McLaren, one of the most influential evangelicals, who said in Purple Podcast in 2005, I believe, I've got the darn thing floating in here somewhere, if I can find it, probably not, that hell is, and, and, Hell needs to be understood as the worst advertising God ever had. He said a whole lot more things, but we don't have time to get into it. Knowledge and power. And I've got to tell you, the occultists understand that full well. I'm holding in my hand a little book that I do not, for those of you watching this, recommend that you get. In Michael Harner's The Way of the Shaman, He's a well-known occultist. He's actually a practicing shaman. He's a professor at some big university, or he was. He said, a shaman is a man or a woman who enters an altered state of consciousness. In our parlance today, Oprah Winfrey would have called it the silence. You familiar with that term? A man or a woman who enters an altered state of consciousness at will to contact and utilize an ordinarily hidden reality in order to acquire knowledge and power. Unquote, page 25. Knowledge and power is the key thing. Now look, there are only two sources of genuine supernatural power in scripture. There are no latent powers of the soul spoken about anywhere there, and we could do an entire hour and a half just on this subject. You either have the spirit of God working miracles in order to validate the testimony of the of the prophets of the apostles of his disciples who are spreading the word you have the spirit of the living god or you have spirits of devils working miracles revelation 13 revelation 16 revelation 19 janice and jambres in pharaoh's court had genuine power up to a point because the demons 
and those who serve them are not omniscient, they're not omnipotent, they're not omnipresent. They have nevertheless genuine power. I had my hands up to here in it, working with the medium in Mexico City. And there are four ways at least, maybe more, but four ways to gain occult power. One is through heredity. There are people in the church who will say, oh my goodness, don't talk about that. Never mind the Ten Commandments where he says, the Lord God says the sins of the fathers are visited on the children those children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me no 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 it all falls away really then why is it that children of occultists children even of Christians wind up with these occult abilities psychic abilities that they think well I can use the psychic ability and if I just give my life to Jesus and Jesus is at the center I'm giving some direct quotes from some big names that if I mentioned you would recognize them then, then it turns into a gift of prophecy and a, a scriptural word of knowledge, not an occult power. Look, it comes down the family line. Read Exodus 20, verse 3 through 6 in the Ten Commandments. My great-great Aunt Dixie was a powerful, well-known, world-renowned telekinetic medium in the 1920s in, and in the, the late 1800s. Performed before Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. She predicted that someone in my generation would inherit her powers. Why it showed up with me, I don't know. The living God knows, but it can come down the family line. All the mediums and occultists know it. Through laying on of hands is the second way you can gain occult power. Think of it in the, in the terms of, of Todd Bentley and the New Apostolic Reformation in the third wave as transferable anointing. Oh, they're transferring an anointing, all right. Anointing of what? Because it is not from God. We'll touch on that in a minute. Through personal experimentation, well, I don't think I've got a cult bondage in my life because she got, well, yeah, I played with a Ouija board, but only a few times, and well, yeah, it moved, and well, yeah, door slammed, and well, yeah, the lights were clicking on and off, but that doesn't mean I was into the occult. When you experiment at things that God calls abomination, and we'll touch on that probably in the next session this afternoon when we talk about Halloween and your kids, We'll talk about how that experimentation can open up doors. And then devil subscription. There are people, some of the big names that our children are listening to, the Madonnas and the Beyonce's and some of these others, have made, I suspect, literal pacts with the devil to get what they want. Power and knowledge. There's only one way, however, to gain a genuine power from the Holy Spirit. Look, I'm not a cessationist. I don't believe the Holy Spirit went belly up at the end of the first century. He is able to do today anything he did in the first century. He did not go on a 1900-year sabbatical. But because of that, the gifts of the Spirit that he talks about in Ephesians and in 1 Corinthians 12 and 14, you've got to understand that you don't inherit those gifts to as many as receive him. To them he gives the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, John 1, 12. When you receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you confess and renounce and repent of all the occult sins, by the way, in Acts 19 you see that, of, of your, your personal involvement with the occult or your inheritance through the occult. The Ephesians came to learn that really well. Then you may know that the Holy Spirit can and will work through you. But I do not believe, and I think some big name ex-mediums who have come to, uh, to the Lord and have given up a whole fortune in the realm of the occult with their tarot cards and other things need to be alert because I do not believe that the Holy Spirit is going to give an ex-medium prophetic miraculous powers, which some indeed can and do work in the power of the Holy Spirit because there's too big a danger of confusing the ancient occult practices and the mediumistic abilities with the true gift of the Lord. Occult abilities are counterfeits of genuine gifts of the Spirit. Look, what's the purpose of a miracle? Hebrews 2.4, God also testified with them both by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will, not yours. Not at seven o'clock, we're having a healing miracle service. Show up and God will give you your miracle, hallelujah according to God's own will. It's in order that you may know the Son of God has authority on earth to forgive sins, Mark 2, that he says to the paralytic, stand up, take up your pallet, go home. What is Satan's purpose in a miracle, in the occult? To deceive, 
to lead you away from a dependence on the Lord God and his word to lead to destruction and idolatry to a grandized self and you see that tragically from the pulpits of a lot of churches the occult has been on the rise for at least a hundred years and especially in the last 50 and today literally millions of people are involved Look, we aren't going to get into a lot of the polls. You've seen an abundance of polls and statistics, all of them important. If you got nothing else from Pastor Bob's important presentation today, it's that the world is in a mess, our society is in chaos, and our children are in trouble. But I want to give you a little taste of what this is about and some of the polls and statistics that have been going on for some time. I collected this one. It, go, it says, um, alternative thought is taking root. And it talks about how metaphysics and mi the occult and mysticism is growing at all levels of society. This was in the New York Times News Service and a, a article that came out in 1986. This, I've been collecting this stuff since the early 70s. And it talks about how representatives of some of the nation's largest corporations, including IBM, AT&T, General Motors, met in New Mexico to discuss how metaphysics, the occult, and Hindu mysticism might help executives compete in the world market. And boy, today with mindfulness, with Reiki, with yoga techniques, with Buddhist techniques, it has gone fully mainstream. You don't see these articles that much now because it's kind of blended into the word work. It's become such an integral part of society that they don't need to write whole articles about it. But here in another article in 1987, Father Greeley's scientific survey, mysticism goes mainstream. New data shows Americans, most Americans, have experienced DSP or had contact with the dead and psychological tests show they may be the better for it. Well, I got news for those psychological tests. I've got a stack of articles here uh, called The Dark Night of the Soul, for example, talking about how they're having to establish, and they were doing that even 25, 30 years ago, the Groffs, for example, setting up whole organizations to minister to the people who flipped out, lost their minds, in other words, became demonized or mentally unhinged through their practice of meditation and yoga and transcendental meditation and Reiki and etc. ad nauseum. Another, I tell you, it kind of makes you wistful when you see articles like, in the poll of the most intelligent, 69% believe in ESP, telepathy, and clairvoyance. The poll of the most intelligent, that would be Mensa that it's talking about here, and how so many of them, even back all these years ago, and I think, was this out of one of those bastions of American journalism? Oh yeah, the National Enquirer, 1978. I love the Enquirer. Every once in a while you get a decent article there, but it takes you about 30 years to get to it. <laughs> Here, the most intelligent are believing these things, understandably so, but I've always been fond of observing that Mensa, for those of you with a knowledge of Spanish, is slang Spanish for dimwitted. Don't tell them I said that. It makes you wistful for the days of the crystal powered pants. Do you guys, you, any of you old hippies here encounter the crystal powered pants? It was a garment, a pair of pants, in which some ent enterprising young, young New Agers had sewn a crystal, a tiny crystal in the back of the pants. You're nodding. Did you ever see that? No, then stop nodding yes, because I'm paying attention to you. At, for the, in the hopes that it would help awaken the kundalini force and raise the chakras. Look, you're getting the picture. More report mystical experiences than ever before, on and on. Of course, these crystal-powered pants, by the way, P.S., I always assumed, and I think rightly so, were for New Agers with deep-seated problems. One or two of you are awake. But then the question came up, and I'll tell you, we could talk about these statistics, those statistics that tell you that now 65% of those surveyed express belief or report in having experiences with a variety of supernatural phenomena, believing in astrology. I once spoke to a woman's retreat where 100% of the women 
Well, actually, 98 of them, the, two, the pastor's wife and the, the worship leader came to me afterwards, raised their hand after I explained what the occult was and said, yeah, we were into it. And the pastor's wife and the worship leader came in afterwards. How many of you checked your horoscope to find out if you should come listen to us today here? Have been in touch with the dead or consulted a psychic? This is Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life, 2010. Two in three adults believe in or have had an experience with at least one supernatural phenomenon. Look, the statistics go on and on. 23% in this poll said that yoga is a spiritual practice. Not religious, not tied to Hinduism. We can do it on a neutral level. The Yoga Journal, a few years ago, observed that there were at least 18 million in the U.S. tied into yoga. And in fact, nevertheless, my sweet brother in Christ, Ray Jungen, who's gone to be with the Lord a week before he died. He and I were chatting on the phone. This was in 2016. And he said, I've got to share with you this exciting thing. Look what I found, he said. He said, practitioners of yoga have gone from 20 million to 37 million in the last four years. This was in 2016. And he was aghast to report that men were a good number of those getting involved with it. It seems that Spandex and public stigma has kind of gone the, by the wayside there. Athletes are now into it and men, big virile men don't care being seen in their little spandex yoga suits. In 2012, there were 4 million men involved in yoga. In 2016, there were 10, 10 million involved in yoga. And it is horrifying when you see how many people are being drawn into the practice of something that has for millennia been an inextricable, inextricable, did I say that word right? I'll get it out eventually, part of Hindu mysticism. You come across little articles like we did when we were heading up to Cambria a few weeks ago. And in this little clearly new age coffee shop that we made the mistake of stopping into, October 25th through 28, you can go to a stony yogi camp out, a conscious cannabis yoga and dance retreat. And I suspect with one of these, oh yeah, that's a fun way to do yoga. They're, they've got Birkram Kriya yoga, they've got naked yoga, they've got laughing yoga, they've got yoga for moms and babies, baby yoga. They've got all kinds of yoga things. And people are absolutely taken with this stuff. What does yoga mean, by the way? Yoga means to yoke. It means union with God. What God? Brahman, the force, the, the impersonal force to which we all belong. Kind of the force that, that was spoken of in Star Wars. It's union with God, yoking you to a demonic entity. Om chanted during meditation meeting is meant to unite your spirit with a universal soul. Om is a sacred Hindu sound symbolizing the absolute. And the breathing exercises, the pranayamas, are also said to promote psychic abilities. It has always been an integral part of occultism. And I know because I was involved in yoga. I was learning yoga from a disciple of Indra Devi and several others in Cuernavaca in 1971 and 72. I was teaching Hatha yoga and I thought this is a wonderful way to experience cosmic consciousness, union with the divine. And it brought such peace and such tranquility for a period of time. And you've got people in the church who've embraced this. I've got article after article after article after article. Yes to yoga, says Christianity Today in what year? I don't care what year, a couple of years ago. And in this art, 2015, May 16th, yes to yoga, can a Christian breathe air that has been offered to idols? Asks this one person, oh yes, I'm an evangelical. I love doing yoga, says, uh, somebody at Wheaton College. And Christianity Today, sister publication, Today's Christian Woman, promoting yoga, yoga's breathing techniques, the pranayama, may seem to release stress, yet they can be an open door to psychic influences. 
when you put yourself in the mystical altered state of consciousness that do, look hatha yoga isn't just so that you can be as gorgeous as raquel welch at age 92 or however old she is hatha yoga as an integral part of the Hindu system, cataloged by Padanjali, there's a great deal of discrepancy about how long ago that was, but a very long time ago, had stated that as part of the practices, we need to teach the body to die. We need to learn to enter an altered state to keep the body calm. And each asana, each posture in yoga is designed and modeled and patterned after a particular Hindu demon god. They've got millions of them to choose from. And as you're doing the, the, the postures, the asanas, whether it's the sun worship, and no, not S-O-N, I'm sorry, Susan Bordenkircher and the others who think they can say yes to yoga, what you're doing, whether you intend it or not, is you are mimicking, invoking the demon spirits who know perfectly well what those postures in the context mean. Who know that when you're doing yoga properly and you're engaging the pranayama, the breathing techniques, where you're learning to inhale and exhale, to bring the mind into that place of silence that Oprah is so fond of and that so many in the contemplative movement are so, so anxious to attain. You are opening your mind. The brain is a machine a ghost can operate, said a prize winning Nobel physicist, Nobel Prize winning physicist, who said the brain is a machine a ghost can operate. The question is, which ghost? Because when you put yourself in the altered state of consciousness that invariably comes when you're doing yoga properly with the breathing, with the asanas, with the consciousness, the mindfulness, if you will, of each moment and each movement, then you're invoking. It's like that drop of blood. Oh, but that's not my intent. Ray Jungen had a wonderful illustration in, in his book, um, uh, A Time of Departing. He said, look, your intent has nothing to do with it. Two people standing on the top of a tall building. One has the intent to throw himself off and fly, fly, fly. The other has the intent to destroy his life. And he's saying, fall, fall, fall. I'll tell you what. Both those dudes standing on the end of that thing, jumping off the end, regardless of their intent, are going to splat on the bottom. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? Oh, but we're doing it at the Y. Yeah, well, get out of there. But I need to be flexible. Good, take a dance stretching class. I will tell you, and it was one of the hardest things for me to accept. Back in 1974, when I was at the Jesus Christ Light and Powerhouse Bible School in Westwood off the UCLA campus, I would have agreed with this gal who said yes to yoga. And there's about 50 billion of, I've got two filed boxes filled with this stuff. I would have said, yes, you're absolutely right, yes to yoga. Until one day at Bible school, I was staying at the house, I get this angry bang on my door and I open the door and I said, John Weldon. In case you don't know who John Weldon is, he's gone to be with the Lord now, but he was a brilliant researcher and author. He wrote one of the, the encyclopedias on the occult and mysticism with John Ankerberg. He was co-author of a whole long series. He had his doctorate. He was utterly brilliant, and we were fortunate and blessed enough to have him as a professor for a while at the Jesus Christ Light and Powerhouse. It was started by Hal Lindsey and a number of Dallas seminary professors. We were really being given seminary level courses. And I said, yes. He said, are you the one teaching all these guys asanas and yoga postures over there? And I said, and? The answer, of course, was yes. I had half the guys staying at the light and powerhouse, twisted up into pretzels, doing the downward dog and the upward thing and the dead pose and the that pose and standing on their heads. And they were all feeling so much better. He says, you can't do that. I said, I did. He says, you can't do that. I said, but we're not doing, we're not chanting Om or Om Mani Padne Om or any of the, you know, we've, we're, we aren't doing the meditation. He said, Johanna, you don't get it. When you practice these postures, you are, you are putting yourself into that same altered state of consciousness. You don't have to sit there in your lotus pose chanting Om to be meditating and to be opening yourself up. He says, you got to get out of it. I never did yoga again, and I will tell you, I have to admit, I've turned into a shmoo. I loved doing Hatha Yoga. I get it. I understand it. And isn't it tempting to think that you can embrace something that has its roots in ancient Hindu occultism? 
that was never designed just so that women could feel cute in their spandex and do these mystical nifty poses with the guys also in their cute nifty spandex. It was never designed for that. It was designed to help open and develop you so that you could open up that in the asanas, in the postures, in the control of the breathing, you were awakening the kundalini force that was viewed as this mystical serpent. Where have you seen good serpents in scripture any time? As this mystical serpent at the base of your spine, which the little crystal at, in the crystal powered yoga pants were designed to awaken. And it, as you're doing these practices and the breathing, you are in essence, seeing the beginning of progressive demonization. As it rises up through the Shushumna channel, as you suppress the Ida and the Pingala on either side of the spine, the force rises up through the chakras, these psychic centers, this vortex of energy, and awakens each one until it culminates in the crown chakra in which you experience and realize, oh, it's true, I am God. Who was it? I guess, who was it? It was it Warren Smith who said he got a t-shirt from somebody in California. Why am I surprised? The t-shirt said, I used to be an atheist until I discovered I was God. <laughs> yeah. And that's what they're doing. You shall be as God. Hinduism is at the core of it. You cannot divide it. I don't care that you call it Christian praise moves. It is not. But does that stop the pastors in California? Oh, no. The National Pastors Convention, 2004, San Diego schedule. You want to know just a little taste of what they started, the Pastors Convention? They had hundreds of pastors from all over the world, probably all over the country. Do you want to know what they were doing? They opened up from 7 to 10.30. The labyrinth was open, walking the labyrinth. We'll talk about that in a minute if I have time. At 8.30 to 9.15, they had contemplative morning prayer exercises. I will also bring that in in just a moment if I have time. Oh, 8.30 a.m. to 9.15, Sustainable Life Forum, stretching and yoga, taught by the wife of one of the biggest emergent heretics in the church, Shelley Paget. His name is, well, who cares, Mr. Paget. And then the speaker was Rick Warren. The same Rick Warren, who has brought in the contemplative prayer movement, and I'll touch on that in a minute, into the church and promoted it, and who blessed the congregation with a weight loss program, the Daniel Plan, that was led by three hardcore occultists. The first one I know you know, Dr. Mehmed Oz who was a Sufi Muslim, is a Sufi Muslim, who is a spokesperson for transcendental meditation, who is an adherent of hypnosis. He had hypnotists on his program on more than one occasion and mystical practices. His wife is a Reiki master, an ancient Eastern mystical thing that was revived by a Christian Japanese gentleman in, Jap in Japan, who was bringing in now this healing technique, channeling and bringing in your spirit guide. This was what Dr. Rick Warren felt was necessary to lose weight in his church, along with Dr. Amon, who brought in the Kirtan Kriya Yoga meditation, in which you scientifically, he's proved, uh, can see that it helps the brain, it helps restore neurons, it's so calming, it's so meditative. Do you know what you chant to get to that beautiful, peaceful thing? Now sound this out in your head. You chant Satanama, S-A-T-A-N-M-A. Do you know what that means? Satanama, Satan loves in Spanish. And are you that far afield? That Daniel, who's in our, our churches, promoting things, bragging about it right after Rick Warren brought him in, and uh, 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 Mark uh, Hyman, who also is deeply involved in Eastern mysticism. And here Rick Warren had no problem at, oh, and Brian McLaren spoke there too. And lest you think that was just a one-time fluke, I've got here uh, copies of the, the other things, uh, 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 programs from 2006, 2008. They were doing exactly the same stuff, people. This isn't just a little fluke where they didn't know what they were doing and they stumbled into it. 
the biggest America's pastor, Rick Warren, in conferences that promote yoga, walking the labyrinths, Eastern mystical techniques that are bringing you into contact, not with the living God of the Bible. But Johanna, how do you know that? Because I know what the word says. And not only that, the yogis themselves, there is no Christian yoga. I've got a half a dozen articles here by people like Yogi Baba Prem Vedavisharada in 2006. So he said, what are you guys thinking? Are you all so impoverished in your relationship with God and in your understanding of the Bible that you have to come to Eastern mysticism and steal our traditional Hindu practice of yoga and think you're going to have Christian yoga? You fools! What are you thinking? Isaiah 26 would have told Pastor Rick Warren, for you have abandoned your people. Why? Because they are filled with influences from the East and they're soothsayers like the Philistines. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, 80% of Christian youths say they have never been taught anything by their pastors or by their parents about the dangers of yoga or the dangers of mysticism or the dangers of the new age and the occult. Not a word. No study from the word of God, nothing. This church, by God's grace, is likely an exception. Pastor Chris Quintana knows the times, and he warns his congregation and the people who will listen. So what exactly do you expect your kids to do when they get hit with an onslaught of occultist propaganda in their schools? I mean, in 1989, I published my second book called Like Lambs to the Slaughter, Your Child in the Occult. It's out of print now, but you can get it for pennies unless you want a new copy, in which case they'll charge you $69. Don't blame me, it's not my fault. Independent sellers and Amazon. But you need to read it, even though it may be from 1989, the documentation, and I've got almost 700 footnotes, are as valid today as they were back then. But what are you going to do when you've got people who are now coming to you with, with stuff like, like uh, Jack Canfield? Do you remember Jack Canfield? Chicken soup for the soul. I'll tell you what, it put me off chicken soup for decades. <laughs> education in the New Age by Jack Canfield and Paula Klimek. True education means providing an environment in which the student's self-regulated learning process can unfold naturally. And he was talking about more and more teachers are exposing their children to ways of contacting their inner wisdom and their higher selves. I wish I had time to read you this, this occult treatise on how to sneak occult techniques into the schools. I document it extensively. They are deliberately doing that. And, and Roberto Asagioli bringing in the psychosynthesis that, that Alice Bailey was so proud of. He was her disciple. And talking about, we need to bring in techniques now uh, to satisfy the yearning of our higher self, which is the source of our wisdom, creativity, and inner direction. It is also the source of our life purpose, to communicate and contact our higher self, blah da dee blah da dee blah da dee blah Receiving guided imagery and guidance, we'll talk about that in a moment, transpersonal education, see it's scientific, sensory awareness, yoga, centering and relaxation techniques. Oh, and by the way, if you've got one of these narrow-minded, Bible-thumping, fundamentalist, evangelical bigots sitting there with your kids in our schools, then don't tell them we're doing yoga or, or meditation techniques. Just tell them we're doing stretching exercises to de-wiggle your child. They will blatantly, ball face lie to you about that. Biofeedback techniques through movement and martial arts, Sufi dances, enhancing their self-concept. Oh, and if that wasn't enough, teaching them how to contact their radiant self, their special guide, their inner glory, their, oh my gosh, are you getting the picture? All through values, chanting, death education, and boy, I'll tell you, that's a big one. We'll touch on that briefly during the Day of the Dead celebrations that go on. We'll touch on that in the next uh, session on Halloween. Meditation and center. Oh, in case you think I was lying to you, meditation and centering. Centering can also be extended into work with meditation in the classroom. Advice, if you're teaching in a public school, don't call it meditation, call it centering. Every school wants children to be relaxed, attentive, and creative, and that's what they'll get. And anyway, you get the picture. Guided fantasies, dream work. I'll tell you what, Bethel 
in Redding, California must have read their, their synopsis and their syllabus here because mo most of the stuff that is here being brought in by Jack Canfield, one of the biggest promoters not only of self-esteem but of uh, programs, which I wish I could t have time to tell you about. I crashed some of the self-esteem uh, sessions that were being held by Assemblyman John Vasconcellos and Jack Canfield in California, maybe you know, in the, in the mid-80s. And I confronted them, and I had this article in my hand, and I said, gentlemen, you clearly are concerned about children. And they all nodded and said yes. There were a lot of pastors sitting there as part of this task force on self-esteem. And I said, but you'll forgive me for observing that it seems to me that you're using self-esteem as a Trojan horse to introduce hardcore Eastern mystical shamanistic occult practices into the same schools from which you have summarily banned any mention of God or Jesus or the Bible. Why is that, gentlemen? You should have heard the gasping and the sputtering on that one. And it's not by coincidence that kids are being drawn into the occult. Marilyn Ferguson in The Aquarian Conspiracy in 1980 said, you can only have a new society, the visionaries have said. Listen to the language of this Aquarian conspirator, this new ager who's now found out just how mistaken she was in her perspectives. You can only have a new society, the visionaries have said, if you change the education of the younger generation. Of the Aquarian conspirators surveyed, those who were working deliberately to bring in a one world government, a one world religion, a one world food authority, a one world monetary system. Think the United Nations on steroids. This is exactly what they're working to bring about. More were involved in education than any other single category of work. Teachers, administrators, policymakers, educational psychologists, they are, as one expressed it, in a peaceful struggle within the system. They are heroes in education, as there have always been heroes trying to transcend the limits of the old structure. We're getting to it here. But their efforts are too often thwarted by peers, administrators, parents, those pesky individuals who think that maybe children have the right to grow up without indoctrination into Eastern occult practices. Mario Fantini, former Ford consultant on education, and now at the State University of New York said bluntly, the psychology of becoming has to be smuggled into the schools. The psychology of becoming what? God. You shall be as God. The media onslaught on our kids is extensive. And I lost it in the middle of this pile somewhere, but I've got Example after example after example after example, how the techniques of yoga, mindfulness, meditation, shamanism, the things that I, I touched on, that Jack Canfield was introducing even in 1978, are being taught in your schools, right down to teaching kids how to meet their personal wise person, their spirit guide. And then it's bolstered by the media onslaught, Star Wars, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Harry Potter, We'll talk about him this afternoon. Twilight, Avatar, Charmed, Sabrina, which by the way is coming out with a new satanic version of their, their, their cute little, cutesy little program of three sister witches who get together and do all kinds of stuff. The internet, occult games, Halloween. Look, the occult is not just out there, however. It is now deeply entrenched in the church because of the ignorance and lack of discernment in the body of Christ. A 2003 Harris poll of Christian adults, not them heathen out there, but us Christians in here. 96% of Christian adults, 50% believed in ghosts. 27% believed in astrology to make decisions. When they say to you, consult the mediums and the wizards who chirp and mutter, should not a people consult their God? Should they consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and the testimony, said the Lord through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 8. If they do not speak according to this word, what word? My word? No, this word. It's because they have no dawn in them. And yet foolish Christians are out there checking their astrology charts to see what they're supposed to do. Going to Madame Bonnie down there on the corner of PCH and God knows what, to have their palm read so that they can know what to do because, gee, we, who needs to ask God? 
21% believe in reincarnation. I wish we could do a couple of sessions on that. We don't have the time. Millions of these Christians believe in near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, ESP. Mark Galley on a review about the near-death experiences of Little Burpo, in other words, saying, hey, you know, okay, we may have a problem. Alexander Eben and some of these others who've had near-death experiences are coming back and saying, well, okay, God presented himself to me and he called himself Om. We may have a problem with that, but gee, golly, we know that he's getting into heaven because look at the experience that he had. You want to know what's ironic in the church? Of all the occult uh, statistics I could quote you, only the belief in the devil possession has dropped since 1990, Gallup News Service. Half of Americans who call themselves Christians don't believe Satan exists. Fully one third are confident Jesus sinned while on earth. Are you hearing this? 25% dismiss the idea that the Bible is accurate in all that it preaches. People, why are Christians getting involved in the occult? Why are we seeing it, Christian occultists? Why are we seeing it pour in through our, our door, the doors of our church? It's because our foolish pastors are not warning the congregation. Why? Because half of them are tied into it. Or as Pastor Chris mentioned earlier, because they're scared if they say anything, they're gonna open up a can of worms. But are we surprised with the lack of discernment when you got doctrine from the church you open the door wide to indeed has God said I had one pastor in my own church actually say to me oh doctrine schmoctrin when my beloved and I were trying to protect the congregation from a latter rain manifest sons of God re replacement theology if I left anything out new apostolic reformation shepherding pastor that they wanted to inflict on the church whose books were endorsed by David Paul Young Cho I said, look at his doctrine. My beloved said that. We got fired out of our church for trying to raise awareness on this. Praise God. Why are we surprised then in another Barna survey of the spiritual gifts among the gifts claimed that are not among those deemed to be spiritual gifts in the passage of scripture that teach about gifts were a sense of humor. Oh, that's a gift of the spirit. Singing, health, life, happiness, patience, a job, a house, compromise, premonition, creativity, clairvoyance. You think Christians aren't embracing doctrines of devils? Somewhere along the line, a lot of pastors are neglecting to teach the full counsel of God. And the Apostle Paul in Acts 20, when he had the elders of the church of Ephesus there, gathered them together and he said, I bear you witness that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Why? because I did not shrink back from declaring to you the full counsel of the word of God. And I warn you that after my departure from among your own selves, teachers will arise, wolves in sheep's clothing, leading the flock after them. Oh, but you can't say anything about, about Brian McLaren or Rob Bell or Rick Warren. I mean, they're, you're naming names. Well, guess what? Read Galatians 2 and read First and Second Timothy. So did the Apostle Paul a lot. He even confronted Barnabas and Peter and called them hypocrites to their face twice because the gospel of Jesus Christ was at stake. People, this is foundational. Second Corinthians chapter 11, 3, 4, and 5, the Apostle Paul said, Look, I'm afraid for you, little children, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your mind should be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. For if one comes and preaches another Jesus whom we've not preached, or a different spirit which you've not received, or a different gospel which you've not embraced, you fools bear it beautifully. Wake up, church. Wake up, pastors. We're going to be running out of time soon. Have I already run out of time? I'm only three pages in. I can't run out of time. <laughs> what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Bill and Benny Johnson, Ken Valaton, Cindy Jacobs, Brian McLaren, Tony Campolo, Rob Bell, Thomas Merton, Henry Nowen, Rick Warren, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, William Paul Young, TBN, who's promoting the works of this universalist heretic, Sarah Young, T.D. Jakes, Patricia King, Bob Jones, Mike Bickle, Suman Kidd, or Roma Downey, and all the rest, their name is Legion, who by shamanism, 
Witchcraft, Eastern mysticism, and the law of attraction visualized Jesus, chanted mantras, decreed commands, and spoke into existence what their greed demanded who quivered with quantum vibrations and read destiny cards, who opened portals into the third heaven and thought they could have tea and bagels with Abraham and Paul, who dreamed dreams and forgot that interpretations belonged to God, who sprinkled fairy dust and angel feathers and cheap glass jewels, twisted themselves into yogic pretzels, who raised the kundalini, howled like rabid wolves, clucked like demented chickens, roared like lions with a bad case of the croup, who slid off their seats and fell in the aisles in seriously unnerving fits of hysterical laughter and had the temerity to call it holy, who by the power of a deceiving spirit uttered false prophets, prophecies and lying divinations declaring thus says the Lord when the Lord did not send them who preferred to stagger about at the stage in drunken stupors making fools of themselves rather than preaching the full counsel of the word of the living God, who forgot that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets, who called down curses on the Bereans, who dared question their deliberate twisting of the word of God, who thought faith in their faith was faith in God, who assumed that because they had spiritual power, it had to be from God, who lay on graves of the dead to suck the power from their bones, who communed with the spirits of the dead and refused to call it necromancy, who reviled angelic majesties and commanded angels to bring me the money, who chanted mantras, breathed breath prayers, lit candles, burned incense, bowed before icons, tormented their flesh, and entered a trance state like any pagan who would use the same techniques, who entered the silence and thought it brought them closer to God, who walked labyrinth, who diddled rosary beads, who engaged in endless vain repetitions and thought it was prayer, who thought God was a force they could manipulate, who assumed that psychic powers they had as a child could be used for God as long as Jesus was at the center, who taught God's people to treat God's word as a tool to enter an altered state of consciousness and dared call it Lectio Divina, who are as ravenous wolves among the flock who rejected discernment and demanded an experience regardless of its source, who exchanged sound doctrine for doctrines of devils and teachers who tickled their ears, who heard the real Jesus calling from his word and instead embraced a mealy-mouthed channeled counterfeit, who sought unity at the expense of sound doctrine, who thought God wouldn't care as long as they were sincere, who forgot that rebellion is as a sin of divination, who did not fear to offer strange fire at the altar of God, who exchanged the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ for another Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel, which will righteously and roundly earn them the words of the Lord in Matthew 7, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. And then who looked and saw the utter devastation in the lives of their children and wondered, where did my child learn that? Let he who has ears hear what the Spirit of God says in warning to his church. <laughs>